I'm Richard Knight, your moderator for this session. This session is the International Kidney Innovations Consortium. International organizations working in the space provide global perspectives. It is my pleasure to introduce a good AAKP friend and ally, Dr. Kamyar Kelantar Zeta. He is past president of the International Federation of Kidney Foundations and World Kidney Alliance. I also had the good pleasure of participating during this past World Kidney Day on a panel in which he moderated. Dr. Kalantar Zeta, I pass it on to you. Hello, I'm Dr. Cam Kalantar or Kalantar Zadeh, a practicing nephrologist in Southern California. I would like to acknowledge and appreciate the American Association of Kidney Patients for inviting me to this uh, important platform. And I would like to introduce uh, some of the ideas about the International Kidney Innovations Consortia and uh, also what we would like to share with you and uh, ask for your feedback. So this is the disclosure of uh, my financial relationships. I work with a number of uh, companies. I also represent the International Federation of Kidney Foundations and World Kidney Alliance. And this is the organization that has been around for almost 20 years and is one of the co-founders of the World Kidney Day, which I'm going to highlight. The World Kidney Day uh, solidifies the importance of education and awareness about kidney health and kidney disease. It was inaugurated in 2006, some 15 years ago. This is the first paper that was published about why we need a world and why the world needs to acknowledge and celebrate the World Kidney Day. These are the themes of the World Kidney Day of the past several years. Every year, the World Kidney Day Steering Committee chooses one theme. For instance, the theme of 2021 this year is living well with kidney disease. If I have a kidney disease, I would like to live well and happy. Uh, as I said, the World Kidney Day 2021 has an important theme of living well with kidney disease by highlighting patient and care partner empowerment. And I'll go over this, what it is. So living well with kidney disease also includes in the uh, importance of quality of life. That means how kidney disease could have an impact on our daily living and the treatment that we receive, including the and kidney transplantation and medications, the treatment satisfaction with the clinical outcomes that we are uh, trying to strive. To advance research practice and policy, there is increasing recognition of the need to identify and address patient priorities, patient values, and patient goals. As you can see here in this kidney care chart, which was published a number of uh, months ago in the Journal of Medicine, diseases. What notion was earlier dialysis, the better dialysis. And then on top of the chart, you see the other option of never dialysis. We are here to talk about other options in between so that a patient with kidney disease, a person with kidney disease have different options and not to be a dichotomy. This is what I'm talking about, that the option of never dialysis exists and this is in, within the context of the conservative management of kidney disease or supportive care. And this is usually to the uh, conventional approach, which is earlier dialysis is better and, and is considered life-sustaining care. And we're here again to expand the options. And these options or choices are based on one keyword, hope. Hope is the feeling of trust. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain outcome to happen. And hope is an important element when you have a chronic disease, in particular when you have chronic kidney disease, that is worsening over time. Many patients who come to see me, they say that, doctor, I don't want to start dialysis, but I don't want to die. I don't want to think of dying. I want to live well. And this is the question that many have. 
And one of the studies out of many have highlighted something that we should have been well for a long time aware of that. And it's patients' preferences, ability to travel, ability to work, to study, to educate, to socialize and have less dialysis. And also at the same time, not suffering from problems such as fatigue, cognition issues, depressions, health health. So the World Kidney Day 2021 has the theme of living well with kidney disease, which includes different areas. But in the heart of these areas is a keyword, life participation. What is life participation? So what is life participation? It's the ability to engage in meaningful activities of life with uh, having chronic kidney disease, work, study, family responses, travel, sport, social and recreational activities. And it's even in a life situation. Life participation is broader than health-related quality of life. It's about life priorities and values and values with family members. And many patients have caregivers. They are actually care partners. And we often use the keyword caregiver, not appreciating that your caregivers are also your care partners. And the difference is that their life is also affected by the life of the patient. So it's a two-way street for care partners versus a one-way street for caregiver. And the care partner is also affected by the kidney disease of the person and therefore the career goals and occupational and leisure aspects of life of the care partner may also so they have every right to also want to be empowered in living well with kidney disease now it's important for a patient and a care partner of a patient to have choices and choice means to be able to choose between or among several options Whereas traditionally, the choice is between two different approaches, and that would be dichotomy for us to be able to team up with the patients with kidney disease, we, may, we must expand these choices and, and we must go beyond and above dichotomy. And here I have highlighted conservative management, gradual transition to dialysis, not abrupt transition to dialysis, expanding palliative care and, and also palli palliative dialysis. And these are options rather than dichotomy. Instead of saying either you are a dialysis patient three times a week or you go to palliative care and, and path of end of life without dialysis, I would like patients to have four or more different options. And this is what we offer to them, including expanded use of palliative care and this means symptom management so that no person with kidney disease would continue to suffer if possible. And I would like to emphasize the uh, important keyword, symptom management. And, and this path of palliative care is not the end of life path, but the opposite. I want to live happy and well with kidney disease. So therefore, while the kidney disease is progressing and while we are thinking of uh, dialysis or kidney transplantation, the highlight would be preservative management. How I can slow CKD progression, how I can prevent or delay dialysis, not in a bad way, not in a way of uh, palliative or hospice medicine, but in a way for, that is patient-centered and also to improve patient's longevity. And even when a patient starts dialysis, I would like the patient to continue to have kidney function, native kidney function. It's called residual kidney function. And this is the incremental approach to dialysis, gradual approach to dialysis, once or twice weekly dialysis. While it's important also to offer the palliative uh, options of no transition to dialysis or, or stopping dialysis, we need to highlight symptom management. And with that means a person with kidney disease should not continue suffering from fatigue, pruritus, other symptoms, pain. There is no reason for my patient to have pain while I claim that I have given you enough dialysis and you cannot complain. To the point that effective symptom management should be the main core 
target of our partnership, partnership of healthcare providers and the patients. So once again, that was one of the four areas of the living well with kidney disease. That means not having unpleasant symptoms of fatigue, pain, depression, cramps, restless legs, and nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipations. We should not have our patients continued suffering of these. And, and these symptoms happen very frequently. As you can see here, I'm going to highlight two studies for you so that you all know if you are a care partner of a patient or if you are a patient with kidney disease, you should not feel embarrassed having these symptoms. And as you can see here, another study highlighting dialysis symptom index assessment, constipation, muscle cramps, feeling tired, dry skin, trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. These are among the problems that I, nephrologists, have been trying to help my patients for the past 25 years. Patient kidney groups, as this one, the renal support network groups that has been also around for 30 plus years and, and working also closely with other patient groups. They always say something, look at here, dialysis is not at our target. Dialysis is in order to live well. Don't live to die alive. And I would like to once again reiterate the new approach to dialysis, which is incremental or gradual. And if a patient prefers that, if my patient prefers once or twice weekly dialysis, then I offer it to him or to her. And this is what we have been doing in Southern California, which is now going all around the country and, and actually beyond the borders of the United States. That means starting or transitioning dialysis slowly and gradually. And, and we are thinking of this as an important thing because it's already been implemented. Mr. Alan Henry Nelson, who was with us until last year at this time, uh, who chose dialysis as when he was 71 years old and he lived well with dialysis and he created a motto that dialysis means life. For him, dialysis was living well with kidney disease. And when a patient chooses dialysis or kidney transplantation, that must be it. That means we should continue suffering while I have chosen this or that kidney replacement therapy. So while we are meet with the World Kidney Day Steering Committee, we are also brainstorming different topics for 2022 as the main theme, such as engage, educate, and empower the three E's or prevention of kidney disease, but some of these themes are not maybe quite, who say prevention of kidney disease, what about millions of people who have kidney disease? If I say I want to prevent kidney disease, what about those who are on dialysis? If I choose conservative and preservative management of kidney disease without dialysis, and what about world kidney recipes? I'm going to highlight a few of them. The International Federation of Kidney Foundations, which is also the World Kidney Alliance, and entertaining different that are also relevant to the contemporary unmet need. So if you look at the themes of the past 15 years, are your kidneys okay? Is kidney disease treatable, harmful, your amazing kidneys? And now go all the way down to 2011, living well with kidney disease. I personally, I like engagement. Email me, contact me and tell me what other themes you suggest since I'm also am privileged to be co-chair currently a co-chair or one of the two co-chairs of the World Kidney Day Steering Committee. And this is essentially what we do. We email, we meet. This is one of our meetings with the International Federation of Kidney Foundation and International Society of Nephrology, ISN and IFKF, the two co-founders of the World Kidney Day. We meet at least once a month, we brainstorm and we try to see what would be the best approach for these and upcoming years. For instance, the World Kidney Day of 2020 was about prevention of kidney disease, prevention to detection to equitable access to care. Secondary prevention, that means if you have early disease and then tertiary prevention, when you have advanced kidney disease, how we can help you not to get worse. I've highlighted nutritional therapy, the, you, the, the role of diet and lifestyle modification. And one of the areas I work with, for example, with my patients is about plant-based diet. That means eating 
less meat, more plants. However, pre precision nutrition means that a given patient may have different needs. So one fit, one size fit all does not apply here. So once again, here back with the International Federation of Kidney Foundation and World Kidney Alliance going over different options. And one of them is preservative management, how I can help people with kidney disease to preserve the kidney function, even when they start their own disease. And if they receive a kidney transplantation, how that can be preserved. And one thing that some people like me believe in is that medication is not enough. It has to be a combination of one and two. That means non-pharmacologic pharmacologic strategies such as dietary and lifestyle and CKD targeted therapies to achieve the greatest kidney and patient survival. The IFKF had in 2016, for instance, a consensus meeting about preservative and alternative aspects. And let me share with you two areas so that you know innovation needs to continue. So history have shown that prior to dialysis, bowel, your gut could have been used as a dialysis membrane. Therefore, the question is if a patient has diarrhea, does he or she need dialysis? I sometimes tell my patient, if you have diarrhea, you don't need to come to dialysis today. Or if you eat less meat, that replaces dialysis. Or if you make a lot of urine, you need today for this week, maybe one or two sessions of dialysis. And another innovative approach, for instance, is to leverage perspiration and sweating in lieu of dialysis. And smart colleagues such as Dr. Keller has come up with this idea or reinvigorated the idea. And, and we need to team up again to examine these and other options, not just dialysis and kidney transplantation. So once again, International Federation of Kidney Foundation and World Kidney Alliance is here for you. Please email me and contact me what other ideas you have, what other expectations you have. And I would like to mention one or two slides about the World Kidney Recipes. Eat smart, eat well, enjoy life. We are not here to tell you what not to eat. We are here to help you, to tell you what to eat. That's enough with telling you can't eat this, you can't eat that, this has potassium, this has phosphorus. Let's team up to create World Kidney Recipes, a collection of renal recipes from all around the world, across all different cultures, so we all enjoy together. And we have advanced plant-dominant, PLA dough or Play-Doh diet, plant-dominant diet. That means a diet that is mostly from plants. It's not vegan or vegetarian, it's mostly from plants. And, and I also try my best to adhere to this diet because I, if I want to tell my patients to do something, I need to be able to do that myself. Otherwise I will become a disconnected nephrologist or disconnected dietitian. And here are examples of our new project, War Kidney Recipes, Eat Smart, Eat Well, and to be inclusive of different expectations, different cultures, to make it fun to be a kidney disease patient and to be inclusive. These are colleagues from Hong Kong who have highlighted their kidney recipes, what we can eat and enjoy, not what we cannot eat. Why? Because when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. No disease that can be treated by diet should be treated with any other means. In summary, World Kidney Day Steering Committee has chosen 2021 to be the year of living well with kidney disease. Despite COVID pandemic that has affected many aspects of our life, indeed more reasons to choose living well with kidney disease so that patients with kidney disease and patients care partners are not forgotten in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. Living well with includes patient and care partner empowerment, empowering patient and care partners, life participations, patients not suffering from and symptoms, and patients with CKD and their care partners should feel well and supported through concerted efforts by kidney care communities. And we are thankful to American Association of Kidney Patients and other patient organizations for making this happen. You guys are very strong. 
the U.S. Congress listens to you more than listening to me, the nephrologist. And we team up together with you, with kidney foundations, with patient groups, professionals, to work together to also find important themes for the year 2022 World Kidney Day and beyond. And I would like to acknowledge people where I work at the University of California, Irvine, where I'm privileged to be the chief of nephrology and working with 20 plus nephrologists and many healthcare providers. And please share with me your thoughts. You, uh, email me and, and uh, visit my social media. I would like to know what you think about the uh, themes of the 2022 and, and subsequent year for the World Kidney Day. Thank you, and I thank American Association of Kidney Patients for giving me this opportunity to present today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kalan Tarzana. That was a very insightful presentation. I particularly enjoyed the concept of preservation management and the notion of incremental transition to dialysis we think that is something whose time has certainly come. We look forward to learning more about that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to listen to our second speaker for this session, another good friend and ally of AAKP. Professor Agnes Fogo is currently the president of the International Society of Nephrology. Professor, I welcome you to the stage. Greetings, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address this wonderful global summit. My name is Agnes Fogo. I'm a renal pathologist and professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, where I have spent my professional career. I am also very, very honored to recently have taken over and been elected to be president of the International Society of Nephrology, the ISN. We are a global professional association dedicated to advancing kidney health worldwide starting from 1960, and we work through education, grants, research, and advocacy. Our main missions are really important to outline. We want to bridge the gaps of available care through advocacy and collaborations with all of our global partners. We want to build capacity in healthcare professionals through granting programs and a big focus on education and research. And very importantly for this summit, we want to connect our community that importantly includes you, the patients, to develop a stronger understanding of the management of kidney disease. Patients are at the heart of what we do. And I should say in this context, our kidneys are at the heart of the matter. Our patients should play a key role in driving policy and regulatory change through joint advocacy with professional associations like us, the ISN. Indeed, as a non-state actor that is in an official relationship with the World Health Organization, we support strongly the 1978 declaration based on the meeting in Alma-Ata in Kazakhstan that patient participation is a fundamental component for designing effective and sustainable healthcare systems. Patients need to be involved in health policy decision-making and you need to be equal partners so that patient views and needs are incorporated into the services delivered and policies. Increased patient involvement is associated with improved quality and safety of healthcare services and higher cost effectiveness and very importantly, better health outcomes. The ISN is an international society. As the name says, we have members in 161 countries, and we strongly believe that these efforts must be applied globally and in a matter that is very cognizant and reflects the great inequities in access and quality of management of kidney disease and kidney failure faced by patients across the world. I'm sure that you know very much that the prevalence of kidney disease of CKD, chronic kidney disease, and kidney failures increasing all over the world. Some main forces driving this is the increase in type 2 diabetes and hypertension, obesity, and our increasing aging populations in many places of the world. Unfortunately, this prevalence is rising most rapidly in low and middle income countries because there's a significant increase in these non-infectious diseases, particularly type 2 diabetes and hypertension, including increases in infectious conditions such as HIV that can affect the kidneys, 
And these increases are combined with ill-equipped healthcare systems. In addition to these global problems, we also at the ISN see regional epidemics of kidney disease, particularly with increasing recognition of chronic kidney disease of unknown origin that has been prevalent in agricultural workers and several hotspots across the world. And we, the ISN, are working with patients and other groups for advocacy, understanding, and research for CKDU. I want to now cite Sir George Aline, a wonderful spokesperson designated by the WHO to be a Caribbean leader in disease related to HIV, who spoke last month at the introduction to our Global Kidney Policy Forum, which was focused on North America and the Caribbean. He said, there is a positive association between low income, low source economic status or low educational status and the non-communicable diseases. As a manifestation of that inequality, only 4% of people in low and middle income countries have access to kidney replacement therapy. Whereas in high income countries, 60% of patients who need kidney care have access to kidney replacement therapy. This gap is increasing as the numbers of people projected to needing kidney replacement therapy will increase to 14.5 million with projections that only 9.7 million people will receive it. Just contemplate these words by Sir George Aline. What can we do? Well, these challenges can be compounded by the relative weakness of patient organizations in these country which very regularly can result in the absence of kidney health from public discussion, and hinder the collection of data required to develop strong evidence-based healthcare systems that can deliver what is needed. Based on these facts, we strongly welcome the opportunity to work with the AAKP and other similar organizations. We want to leverage your existing knowledge and experience base to help drive change we want to empower local communities and we want to support developing or nascent patient groups in lower and medical, middle income countries so we together can reach our potential to effect change. Of course, the focus of research and innovation in these parts of the world differ very, very much compared to that available in high income countries. Therefore, there would be a greater emphasis in these efforts to work with these groups to advocate for universal healthcare coverage, to make healthcare, including very importantly, kidney care more affordable, and to demonstrate a causal relationship between the gains in health with gains in economic metrics and productivity gains, and to tackle the social determinants of health that are most pertinent to lower and middle income countries. Ultimately though, whatever the different challenges that people face in lower and middle income countries, the key principles are the same and they haven't changed since the 1978 alma Ata Declaration. Patient participation is a fundamental component for designing effective and sustainable healthcare systems. Patients, you, need to be involved in health policy decision-making as equal partners so that patients views and needs are incorporated into the services that we deliver and our policies. Increased patient involvement, such as that which you allow and promote through the AAKP is associated with improved quality and improved safety for healthcare services, higher cost effectiveness and better health outcomes. We've worked with patients in various networks like the Canadian Can Solve CKD, and this was an enriching and very impactful experience for all of us at the ISN. These experiences reminded us that discussions around details of duration of dialysis therapy can get a little bit academic, doing different formulas, looking at different metrics, when any amount of dialysis therapy indeed is a colossal burden for patients and can be viewed as a failure a kidney failure with life-saving short-term replacement. And that as a patient, there was not such a difference whether dialysis was X minutes or X plus Y minutes. We need to take these factors into consideration. Examples like this that come from your input, from patient input, help us to stay focused on what matters most to the patients and provide us with evidence, both qualitative and quantitative, to be able to effect meaningful policy change 
that matters both in ultimate outcomes and to the quality of life that you experience. Thank you very much for allowing me to give an overview of some of the pressing issues and missions and outlook for the ISN, and we look forward very much to working with you. Thank you, Professor Fogo. And we have a couple of questions for you. The first question is, AAKP and ASN have had a nine-year partnership here in the USA, where each year nephrology experts and patients conduct hundreds of meetings with U.S. congressional leaders and their staff on kidney issues such as research funding, patient care choice, and access to innovations. Over the past two years, we have kept this tempo up virtually during the COVID pandemic. Can you tell those listening today what you have witnessed internationally in terms of the positive influence professionals and patients can have within the government when they advocate together as a team? Thank you for that wonderful question. I'm sure you're well aware that over 3 million patients worldwide with advanced chronic kidney disease undergo dialysis. Now, these patients face a horrible dual challenge. First, they're at higher risk of infection from SARS-CoV-2, up to 20 times greater than the general population because they can't self-isolate. They need to go to in-center care for their regular dialysis. And then the second challenge is that with that exposure comes a disproportionately higher level of suffering from adverse outcomes once they do become infected with that higher risk. This results in a huge increase in risk of death compared to the age-matched hospitalized COVID-19 general population. Let me just emphasize this to you. Can you imagine an in-center hemodialysis patient, young, 20 to 39 years old, has a 432-fold increased risk compared to the general population when COVID-19 infected. And even for somebody over 80, the risk of death is tenfold higher compared to the general non-dialysis patient. These are horrible numbers. Based on this, we wrote to the WHO's Director General in February to highlight these facts and the plight of these patients and citing examples of successful lobbying at national levels by patient and professional coalition, we called for the WHO support to prioritize vaccination of these dialysis patients against the COVID-19 virus. Then we had wonderful collaboration in Italy. Our members helped to secure priority vaccination of dialysis patients by involving them in a survey. So activating and mobilizing the patients and this survey undertaken in Italian dialysis centers during the first pandemic wave had more than 85% of patients responding. When did you ever hear of a survey having a response rate like that? And this data was used to demonstrate the huge mortality rate to Italian policymakers. And we emphasize that by using what we call the four eyes approach, not I as in me, but I for information, informing policymakers of what dialysis is and why dialysis patients are at risk. The second I, involvement, to involve all relevant stakeholders in the process, including the politicians, the media, and importantly, the patient organizations. And our third I, investigation, to investigate in depth the data and to position ourselves and yourselves as a technical referent to know the data in depth. And then injection, our fourth I, the plan to develop a vaccination strategy for dialysis patients easily and rapidly. So this could translate to other health crises. Obviously, the last I might not be an injection of a vaccine. It could be injection of knowledge or injection of resources. Joint advocacy between patients engaging as constituents with their elected representatives and with kidney health professionals engaging with clinical peers in the United Kingdom was also instrumental in convincing the UK's Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization, the acronym is JCVI, you may be more familiar with that, to urgently amend its prioritization schedule and aim to vaccinate all such adult dialysis patients by mid-February 2021. These successes and other similar successes in Uruguay and Romania led to a webinar, Prioritization of Dialysis Patients and National COVID-19 Vaccination Programs, Lessons Learned from Successful Campaigns, 
where we shared this knowledge with colleagues across the world, we are continuing to work with our colleagues to engage with policymakers and tackle this ongoing threat to our patients to change prioritization for vaccination during the pandemic. Thank you, Professor Fogo. Excellent response. Now we have one last question for you. ISN has been a phenomenal leader in making the international case for great kidney research, more inclusive clinical trials and treatment innovations. As an international professional society, how do you envision an expanded global patient consumer consortium being helpful to your strategic agenda? Another great question. I'm so pleased that you've mentioned our work on more inclusive clinical trials, as it gives me the opportunity to plug and to thank our ISN ACT, Advancing Clinical Trials, Patient Engagement Working Group. Their efforts and development of a position paper are truly impressive. We published a paper called International Perspectives on Patient Involvement in Clinical Trials in Nephrology. This paper highlights the importance of improving patient involvement in clinical trials as a step towards the promotion of high quality research in nephrology. To highlight this work via an international multi-stakeholder meeting in 2020, we use this to develop consensus definitions for clinical trial kidney failure outcomes, which should include a composite that includes whether you received a kidney transplant, whether maintenance dialysis was initiated, whether there was death from kidney failure. And we also wanted to include other outcomes based solely on laboratory measurements of glomerular filtration rate, a sustained low glomerular filtration rate and a sustained percent decline in glomerular filtration rate. This meeting was really wonderful in that included stakeholders of clinical trialists, basic scientists, pharma, and very important patient groups to be able to achieve the most up-to-date and inclusive information about these topics. As you're also aware, the involvement of patients in nephrology clinical trials is limited. Even though they can prioritize research and help with steady design, participation, implementation of results, we still have underrepresentation of our kidney disease patients. Patient involvement is really vital from setting priorities through to the implementation of the trial findings, it really helps to ensure that the evidence that is generated can align with patient priorities. And of course, ultimately, the goal from all of this work is that we can enhance the quality and relevance of research to improve patient care and have successful implementation of the results in all settings. It's also really vital because health professionals consistently give higher priority to mortality and hospitalization while patients give higher priority to outcomes that impact their life, such as ability to travel or to do other enjoyable things. And we need to integrate these priorities and not have it be one-sided based on health professionals' impact on metrics that maybe in the past have been more easily measured. This really reinforces the need for patient involvement to ensure that trials address the impacts of disease and that treatments that are important to patients and address those important quality of life issues are implemented and that those are clear and present in the forefront of the mind of those involved in their care. Noting these points and the barriers to patient involvements, we have to reconsider these. Sometimes patients have a lack of awareness of opportunities to participate. They have a lack of knowledge of clinical research or there isn't enough time, there's ill health, or sometimes there's a lack of initiative among researchers to provide and facilitate those opportunities. We strongly encourage global patient consumer consortia to prioritize efforts to secure the involvement of kidney patients in future clinical trials at all levels. And thank you very much for this opportunity and good luck with the Global Summit. I'm sure it'll be a resounding success and lead to further advances as we try to improve access to improved kidney health for all in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fogel, for your fine responses to those questions. And AAKP really appreciates your participation in this session today. Take care.